Welcome to All American People. Once again, I'm Donald Smith. I got beside me the host of the show, Greg Everett. But yes. we're good seeing you yeah, again, Donald. But we're not we're not talking about Greg today. We're talking about his father, Robinson Everett, which. Uh, we saw uh, this earlier on in the week, part yeah. one, two, and three. That's uh, right. Interview we did in 2007. That's right. But we've got two more that we did a year later. Right. At uh, Garden City Furniture. Oh, absolutely. And uh, but uh, let's talk a little bit about your father. Yeah. We had talked about him being a young, uh, one of the youngest law professors at Duke. But also, uh, if I remember correctly, right. um, he was the old, old longest running. Uh, professor, wasn't he? I'm you know, he uh, he definitely taught continuously for more than five decades. Right, yeah, right. He started teaching in 1950, took five years off, became a JAG officer in the U.S. Air Force, came back in 56, and was continuous from 56 to 2009 to his Amazing. passing, literally. I mean, he was grading exams when he died. Amazing. And uh, also, he, 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 and, and I never had the opportunity to meet your grandparents, his parents, right. but uh, him and uh, we talked about him a few times. Oh, they yeah. were, they were, they were both pioneers. One of them was the first five students at Duke Law School, Reuben Oscar Everett, another R.O. Everett, who practiced law in Durham until his passing in the age of 93 in 1971. Just in April of 71, his wife, my grandmother, practiced until age 97. She was the first woman licensed, uh, the fourth woman licensed in North Carolina, the first woman to argue and win a case in the North Carolina Supreme Court. Uh, argued for seven, I mean, wow. practiced law for more than seven decades. She and was an uh, assembly person also, right? She, no, her husband was a uh, House of Representatives member. She, but she was, was city council. Durham City Council, right, one of yeah. the first two women elected in 51, served until her husband's passing in 71. And it was an amazing, just a one of a and kind. And they had a law practice together. Everett, Everett, and Everett. The and then your of, father. That Everett. And those, now you're that's brother. right. My two bro my two brothers practice law. One of them uh, and his wife in that firm of Everett and Everett. They're in Durham, North Carolina. So, and, and one of them's going to uh, begin teaching law at UNC Law School, where his grandmother, the law library at UNC, is named in uh, my grandmother's honor. And remarkable, remarkable. And, and I remember your father telling some stories about uh, about your grandfather and uh, uh, the diaries that he had left, which we'll oh, talk yeah. about tomorrow because That's now right. uh, we're going to toss to this uh, uh, interview. Won't you do that? Absolutely. Robinson Oscar Everett, uh, back from August 7, 2008. Stay tuned, it's a special interview. Good morning. Welcome to Carolina People. This morning we're at Garden City Furniture at 2444 Highway 17 Business in Garden City. We're focused on 55 years plus of practicing law in North Carolina. And we're visiting with the former Chief Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, Robinson Everett. My father, good morning, Dad. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming in early on a Thursday morning. It's a real treat to be here with you, Greg. It is very exciting to think of so much going on in 55 years plus, almost 60 years now, it's Dad. It's a long time. Of practicing law, yeah, yeah. Do anything uh, that's really made it, uh, made it a passion of yours to keep it going this long? Did you ever think about retiring and maybe doing something else, being a banker or a doctor or? I've done all sorts of other things while I've been practicing law, so I've gotten variety. And I think I'm going to hang around as long as I can. Uh, your grandmother was 97 when she stopped practicing law and retired. I think she was the oldest practicing attorney in America at the time. And I'd like to equal her record if I possibly can. Anyway, I want to hang around. You say that so casual, Dad. She was the oldest practicing attorney in America. You said uh, America, not in North Carolina at the time. I believe that is correct. Uh, there weren't many people around who were who had practiced for 70 years right. as she had. Right, right. A little more than 70. That was in 1991 when she was 97. Actually, so. 1990, at the end of the year, she right. retired. So. Uh, it, I think uh, 70 was... 70 is a good number to stick with. Yes, forgive me not to, uh, not to interject there. But that idea, I remember when they, uh, there was a piece done about her back in 1991, which highlighted that uh, the year before when she had uh, retired, that uh, at the time she was the oldest practicing attorney in the country. And of course, some newspapers report it one way and maybe some another, but at least there was a consensus there on that. She did a lot of practice. Absolutely. That's <laughs> well, you know, it's a funny thing, apropos of the number of years I've practiced, I've been thinking back to when I took the bar exam because just a, a few days ago, uh, 
your two of your brothers and your sister-in-law right, right. took a bar exam in North Carolina. Just ramped it up last Tuesday and Wednesday. I guess that's it. I hope they wrapped it up okay. They won't know for several weeks, but uh, at least they got their JD law degrees. So right. uh, if they can pass the exam, they'll be able to practice. I have called both of them <laughs> repeatedly and your daughter-in-law, my sister-in-law, Sherry, to find out how they did. A, mm -hmm. I haven't heard back from them. I haven't either. Is that right? In more than a week now, so that's not a good sign. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. At least about that. I know we've talked about something else, but they are, they're just waiting anxiously. I'm sure yeah. they are, and I'm, I'm waiting anxiously because uh, your younger brother and his wife are going to come practice with me. Is, oh, yeah, I, I should, I, I don't want to act uh, dumb about it. I am aware of it, but the excitement is, I mean, I, that's amazing. The, I mean, at least that's what they say they're going to do. I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah. And it'll be Everett, 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 just as it was when I was practicing with your grandfather and grandmother. Everett, Everett, Everett. That's amazing, Dad. That's uh, amazing. Now, your older brother, uh, he's going to live in Durham but practice in Raleigh. Right. So I can't get his name into it yet, but maybe there'll be four Everett someday. You think he'd, uh, you think he'd ever contemplate leaving a firm over in Raleigh to I join? Doubt it. I doubt yeah. it. A great firm over there that he'll be with. Wyrick Robbins, Yates, and right. uh, Ponton, and a for Sam Wyrick, a former student of yours. Seems like everybody's a former student. You've got a lot of former students, Dad, and a lot of folks that have come in contact with you. As you mentioned, you did other things or you've done other things over your 55 plus years of practicing. Obviously, we opened up with you being the chief judge retired of the Court of Military Appeals, now the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. That's right. They changed the name. It was Court of Military Appeals with the acronym COMA, right. and that isn't too good an acronym, so. Uh, the name was changed in the mid-90s to Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. Now it's CAF. Yeah, it's CAF. Yeah, a little easier. To, maybe not as easy to rem remember, but a more positive connotation That's there. Right. You know, interestingly, earlier this week, just uh, yesterday and the day before, we had Flo Vinson visiting with us here at Garden City Furniture, who is the president of the South Carolina Bar. Um, is the is the youngest of five children, and three of her four older brothers are all attorneys. Oh, and it's a legal family. Absolutely, very definitely. One of them, uh, pract two of them, <laughs> practice here in the Myrtle Beach area. One in Columbia, and then she's there in Florence, and her parents are in the PD. Uh, it was fascinating thinking about that idea, and earlier before we started filming this morning, the idea of you, who practice with your mother and father, whose mother practiced with her father and who soon will be practicing, assuming they pass the bar, with your son, one of your three sons, and your daughter-in-law. Do you think this, does it run in the blood? Is there such a thing that people can be essentially born into the law? Well, I'm sure that uh, if you're exposed to it in your childhood, it sort of gets into your subconscious. Uh, actually, uh, when I was in college, I wasn't planning to go to law school. It was sort of a last minute decision. I really hadn't thought about anything I was going to do. I just wanted to get my degree and be on my way. And then something happened and I went over and applied to law school and got admitted and things went on from there. What, what could you possibly have been thinking about, let's say at, at that time, back in what was it, 1948, 47, 47? 47. 47? I wasn't thinking about much of anything, to be honest with you. I, I was, uh, I was twenty. I was, I guess, about nineteen at that point. Right. And I'd had a great time in college. Uh, I'd been up at Harvard uh, for college. Uh, I knew I was coming back to North Carolina. At least I planned to, but I hadn't really thought what I was going to be doing. And then, lo and behold, one of my classmates uh, suggested. Uh, I might want to apply to law school. Right, and right. He was, he was doing it, and I thought that's a pretty good idea. I, I get a job with my mother and dad if I uh, get admitted to the bar. So <laughs> things went on from there. So, that, so if someone asked you, were you always planning on practicing law, you'd say categorically not. I wanted to be a detective at one point. Oh, really? Good. We're getting it out of you. Thank you. Yeah, you wanted I, to be a detective. I've seen a lot of detective movies and things like that, and it sort of... Uh, got my attention, so, uh, but I didn't. I didn't think real very seriously even about that. So you clearly feel like you don't feel like you were predestined to become a lawyer. 
Well, I'm a Presbyterian, so I believe in predestination. Right. And you do what the good Lord intended for you to do. So maybe in that sense, I, I feel predestined, but uh, I wasn't thinking about it early on. That's for sure. For sure. I won't be the dead <laughs> horse, but I've got to ask, do you think your parents ever encouraged you into the law? I mean, were they ever thinking, Robbie, you go, go off to Harvard, you come back? They may have, but uh, if they did it, they did it so subtly that I wasn't yeah. aware of it. That's fascinating. That's very interesting. I, I, I love the idea of uh, the detective idea. That's, uh, and of course, you were the same way with your three sons, uh, not necessarily encouraging them, two of them who went into teaching for more than a decade and then ultimately uh, started law school. And I never figured that one out. They were not talking about going to law school. I, yeah. I would have tried to encourage them, but uh, they didn't seem to be going in that direction. Any vivid, when you think back, of course, you were with us last summer. We filmed at East of Chicago Pizza. You actually gave us three days last summer in the heat of the summer. Uh, it was fun. To be with us, which was great filming up there. And, of course, some of the, you had some great memories from your time there at Harvard Law School prior to actually uh, joining your parents' firm or, or uh, taking the North Carolina Bar. You know, as you think back to that time, and there's so many things we want to touch on today, and hopefully you'll be willing to come back and be with us tomorrow since you don't get down to the Garden City area very often. Uh, but th th just reflect back uh, to 60 years, back to uh, when you were in Cambridge, Massachusetts mm. in law school. What were some great memories that really stick out in your mind? Well, there's some very interesting memories. Uh, I, uh, one thing I remember, after seeing Flo Vincent this morning, uh, president of the South Carolina Bar, a woman, and thinking back on my mother, and then I reflected that uh, there were no women at Harvard Law School when I was there. Right. right. I guess we had around 12, 1,500 students, all men. They did not allow women to the year I graduated. After I graduated, they figured it was safe for women. They let them come. But, <laughs> but there were no women. So that's one, one thing that um, uh, has changed. Uh, Things are a lot more uh, sophisticated now. Right. Uh, your students sit around in the classroom with computers. Do all the students in, y in your classrooms uh, have, have computers? Uh, most of them seem to. Most um, of them. Yeah. Um, and um, in, the, in the law offices, the computer is very much relied on. Right. Um, so that's quite a change over the years. Right. Um, I had some wonderful classmates that uh, at Harvard, uh, many of whom went on to some great things. Uh, ironically, just uh, very recently, I saw that one of my classmates, who I think very highly of, has been, who's in the U.S. Senate, has had some problems and uh, been indicted. Who's that? Ted Stevens. Oh, no. Golly. Yeah. A wonderful guy. I can't, uh, I can't believe it. I not only presume he's innocent, I believe he's innocent, you but I don't confident. know the details. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, you get, um, you, you get a chance to meet some really extraordinary people, and right. that was one of the nice things about uh, about law you school. You had some great professors up there. Any that really stick out in your mind? The dean at the time is that uh, was that Erwin Griswold. Erwin Griswold, who uh, he was uh, solicitor general, I guess, under Richard Nixon. Uh, he was a very outstanding scholar, a wonderful professor. Uh, Funny thing comes to mind, uh, in my second year in law school, I had uh, illness and I had to be in the hospital for a while or college infirmary, and I couldn't go to class. My mother, who had been a legal secretary for my grandfather before she became a lawyer, came up to take care of me and also uh, sat in on a class. And the dean, as I understand it, uh, saw this lady sitting there taking notes very strenuously and very carefully, and he thought she was some sort of reporter. And he was about to throw her out of the classroom when somebody told him that she was actually my mother, and uh, he let her stay. Not only that, they later became acquainted, became good friends, and um, also one other interesting thing, I think I did better that semester than I did on some other semesters. <laughs> With she her took, taking notes, yeah. She took very good notes. That is great. Uh, what was that like having her up there in, in, Boston, in Cambridge, staying there? Did she stay with you or she stayed uh, 
Separate. When I was in the hospital, I, I just I think she stayed in the um, the rooming house where I uh, had a room. I'm just right, not sure. Right, right. You don't, don't remember. remember. Yeah, yeah. You do remember though. F interestingly, graduated fourth in a class of 455. Or maybe you wouldn't remember that. I saw that recently. And I think I was in the top one percent. Whatever right. that means. Yeah, yeah. I guess that would fit. Great, uh, great opportunity there. And of course, mm -hmm. to think about coming back to Durham. Then we talk about Durham as your home place. Obviously, mm -hmm. growing up there. We also talk about the classroom. When I say about you in the classroom, you've been teaching there at Duke well, Law you know, School. One other thing comes to mind apropos of Harvard. I was on the Harvard Law Review, and um, I remember the people who were our president of the Harvard Law Review. It took a lot of skill. Uh, so I have been interested in noticing that uh, a presidential candidate was editor-in-chief of the Harvard Law Review. Is, and that's not John McCain? That's not, no. Uh, was was editor-in-chief of the, I didn't know that about uh, Barack yeah, Obama. Yeah. That's tremendous. So I must admit, uh, I'm very impressed by that. I. I don't know what I'll do in terms of voting in the fall, but I am impressed by the fact that Barack was the editor-in-chief of the Harvard Law Review. Absolutely. Year. Yes, you were down here in January and were able to see the uh, presidential debates, the excitement there in the Palace Theater. Of course, it was not only uh, Senator Obama at the time, but also Senator Clinton and Senator Edwards there yeah. up on the stage. What was that like, experiencing the debates live time there at the Palace Theater? Well, there were about 2,200 people sitting there. and. Uh, I don't know. It was just it was an overwhelming experience. Uh, I thought all three of the candidates were very uh, uh, able. Uh, all of them were eloquent. All of them had some interesting things to say. Right. Um, so it was a great experience. Uh, oh yeah. I don't. I didn't think that uh, Edwards was going to get it, but I must admit I. Uh, I probably would have bet on Hillary at that particular time. Is that right? Yeah. Just yeah. in terms of the odds. Mm -hmm. A couple weeks before your wife, my mother, had come down for the Republican event, the Republican debates uh, there at the uh, convention center, and you made it down for the Democratic one. Uh, you would, would you have liked to have swapped uh, seats with her? No, I'm, I'm perfectly happy the way it was. Right. Uh, I frankly would not have put any money on uh, McCain winning I, at that time. I, yeah. was, I was rather surprised that he pulled up and, yeah. and, and wound up uh, far ahead of the others. Right, right, very dumb. But I don't understand politics anyway. The, yeah, well that's, and that's a big big topic and another episode in and of itself. Uh, go well, ahead, yeah. Apropos of politics, I did go to a very moving event recently. Uh, Senator Jesse Helms died and I went to his funeral which was a uh, well attended event with about 900 people in the church. and. Uh, Although uh, I was not of his political party and did not agree with him on all major issues, uh, I must say I was impressed by the fact that he had rendered such uh, uh, extensive service to the people of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, it was nice to commemorate that service. Mm -hmm. Many people in North Carolina would say to many people in North Carolina, not to all people, but hopefully he was trying to serve all. Oh, yes. Hopefully he was trying to serve all people. And as an individual, he was just apparently a wonderful person and, you know, cared for the individual constituents, mm -hmm. which is important. A good husband, father, and grandfather. Of course, his grandson, a uh, fraternity brother of mine at Wake Forest, and a great guy, and only really? could say great things. Rob Knox could only say great things about his grandfather, that he really cared, even though he surely had a lot of folks who didn't like his views and a lot of residents in North Carolina who didn't think he represented their interests at all, so clearly a mixture of uh, emotion there, as most politicians uh, possibly evoke emotions on both sides. Yeah. We've had a very interesting incident in North Carolina concerning a state employee who refused to uh, lower the flag to half mast. I know. Uh, that's created a lot of controversy. Right, even with a Democratic governor, Mike Easley, who said you are going to lower your uh, your staff, whether you like, I mean, lower your flag, whether you like his opinions or not. The guy ultimately lost his job. He lost his job. I read a, a very interesting article in one of the local papers in North Carolina, written by Professor Dan Pollitt, a highly recognized scholar in constitutional law at right. UNC. And Dan uh, takes a position that that was 
wrongful for him to lose his job. I don't know about the merits of that, but some interesting issues. Right. An order from the governor is, uh, it's tough to know whether or not you follow the order or not. What You're do you do state if, you, if your conscience tells you something different? Sure, sure. Which way do you go? Yeah, that's a good point. We talked about growing up in Durham. What is it about Durham that caused you to come back? Other than, of course, your parents, as you said, you've got a place to practice when you got out of law school. Did you ever think about living anywhere else? Well, I was uh, in Washington some at various times uh, working up there, although I always maintained my residence in Durham. Uh, Durham is a very interesting city. It's, uh, it's near some, it's the home of one of the great universities, Duke University. Right. Close to two other major universities, UNC, which I attended at one point, and North Carolina State. Right. So, uh, in terms of uh, intellectual environment, uh, things of that sort, it's and climate, it's just a great place to be. Mm -hmm. A nice community, interesting tradition. Uh, one interesting aspect of the tradition is that the Civil War, we say, ended right outside Durham at the Bennett Place. I thought it was Appomattox. Uh, that's what they say in Virginia, but uh, General Johnson surrendered to General Sherman about a week after uh, Lee surrendered to Grant. And uh, Johnson had approval from the Southern legislature to, the, to surrender. I mean, that was the end of the Civil War. Lee surrendered to Grant there at the Bennett Place. Uh, Johnson surrendered. Or Johnson, yeah. He surrendered to me, Sherman. To Sherman there. Two interesting aspects of it. My father, in 1923, when he was in the legislature, took the initiative in having the Bennett Place, where the surrender <clears throat> was negotiated, having that become a state park. And they have a monument there which has two pillars and an arch. And that word, is, and the one word on the arch is unity. Yes. And that is the hallmark of the Bennett Place, where the North and South came back together. And the two generals who had fought it for years in the Civil War against each other, became good friends in negotiating the surrender. And ultimately, when Sherman died, Johnson was an honorary pallbearer at his funeral. Mm. It was in very cold weather. He stood outside in the snow and ice, got pneumonia, and died. No, Johnson was a pallbearer and got pneumonia and died afterwards. Well, wow. Interestingly, uh, I. Um, I suggested, I've suggested that some of the presidential candidates who are stressing unity sure. come to the Bennett Place and stand there with that monument and say, this is symbolic of the unity that we need. Come back together just as the North and South did in 1865. That would be a powerful image, a great, a great location to stress that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm sorry. Hopefully someone will take you up on it. That's exactly right. <laughs> you know, a lot going on. Uh, right now, uh, both in Durham and, and there at, at Duke Law School. We highlight Duke uh, since not only did you a, take the bar uh, in North Carolina when you finished uh, in law school, you came on back, you were planning on joining your parents' firm, but an opening uh, cropped up there at, at Duke Law School and you joined their law faculty, if I'm correct, in 1950? That's right. There was an opening. The University Council knew my father, asked if I'd be willing uh, it would be interested in filling the opening, and I did. Ironically, I knew that I wouldn't be there very long because the day I graduated from law school, the North Koreans came into South Korea, mm. and there was big trouble, and uh, I w I'd been just a little too young to serve in World War II, so I knew that I would be uh, up for grabs in the Korean War, right. and that I would be uh, uh, leaving to go on active duty. But anyway, I started there and taught for a year. Had a great time. Had some fine students. Uh, and then went on active duty. And I didn't think I'd be back. But I started age 22, which was probably the youngest law fa faculty member they've had. Well, I've read it many times that by far is, is clearly the youngest law uh, the faculty so. member ever hire their age 22. I mean, most folks are just finishing college dead around that same age, let alone law school and let alone joining a faculty. Well, That's, I got off to a good start, I guess. You obviously Fast did, start. yeah. And the way you were able to do that is that through you skipped uh, some grades and right. uh, 
third, eighth, and eleventh. I've heard uh, something around that. But I then don't know you, what I skipped. It, I started a little bit early. Uh, skipped the eighth grade. Uh, skipped the eleventh grade, and then finished uh, college in three years. Uh, right. I can't remember everything, Deb. It gets you, confusing. You know you skipped a few years there. That, that's, and, of course, that, that did help speed things along. But joining and then rejoining five years later, am I correct, back in 1956? Uh, yeah, I came back and started practicing with Mother and Dad. And um, uh, then I got a call one day from the dean. He wanted to know if I'd fill in for a semester. And I did and stayed from then in one form or another right up to the present. Mm. And they're still letting me uh, do some seminars and classes, and I have a great time. You're still teaching first, second, and third year no, still? Not first. Uh, Is that right? Criminal law, I, you're no uh, longer teaching? I, I haven't taught that for about a year. So. Okay, right. So it's now second and third. How exciting. And, of course, your ability to, and we'll get into the criminal law aspect or criminal procedure, the ability to highlight that. And also, we want to talk a little bit about the White Collar Crime Symposium as well as the reentry uh, project and what you've been working on with that. Would you be willing to come back? We're running out of time, I'm sorry to say, but would you be willing to come back and be with us tomorrow? Absolutely. I, I'm sure I've been a little long-winded, but if you'll give me another chance, I'll try to cover some other things. Very definitely, very definitely. Thanks so much for being with us this morning, Dad. Great to be with you, Greg. Absolutely. Stay tuned to a little more Carolina people with Robinson Oscar Everett coming up next. So much of his life has been focused on military justice and the, the needs of service men, men and women all over the world. But there's so much more to Robinson Everett than just that, and we'll get into a little bit of that tomorrow, the Center on Law, Ethics, and National Security, what it was like practicing with his mother and father. The excitement there is the triple family, the first triple family swearing in in the U.S. Supreme Court's history back in 1954, and so many other exciting aspects of his life. There's a lot more to Robinson Everett than what we just got into the last 30 minutes. Come back tomorrow for part two of the Honorable Robinson Oscar Everett. Dad, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Thanks for the chance to be here.